So hello everyone and thank you for your interest in this session today. Um, this is my very first conference presentation, so hopefully things aren't too shaky. Um, as you can see, the title of the session is Late Roman Pottery Imports from Oxfordshire in the Neen Valley in Britain, north of the Humber, Significance and Distribution. The work behind this session um, was undertaken as part of my undergraduate dissertation in 2019-2020 at Newcastle, supervised by Dr. James Gerrard. And the aims of the presentation really were twofold. The first was to map out where possible the quantified distributions of Oxfordshire red brown slipwares and Lonian Valley colour coated wares in Britain north of the Humber. So, starting off the prep project, we knew there were, of course, examples of these two wares in northern Britain, and we suspected that they weren't appearing in significant quantities. And so, the, the first aim really was to, to understand in, in better detail exactly how these wares were distributed um, and also exactly how, mu how much we're talking about. And so, of course, it made extensive use of published volumes, particularly for urban military sites, but also of the grey literature available online and, and unpublished reports um, that people are generous enough to share to get a better understanding for rural sites, for example. And one of the main gateways for that was the Roman Rural Settlement Project uh, online via the Archaeological Data Service and, of course, online databases such as the Portable Antiquity Scheme. And so ultimately, after the data had been collected, it was input into GIS and those two distribution maps were produced and one for Oxfordshire and one for Neen Valley Ware. And then the second aim follows on from that. And once the distributions are established, to look at what they might tell us about how these wares were arriving in the north um, and, and, and why. And so part of that was looking at interprovincial mi mi mobility, migration, um, but also trade and exchange uh, in the late Roman period. And a few very quick methodological points to bear in mind. Um, this isn't in, nor was it intended to be, an exhaustive account of every shirt of Oxfordshire and Neen Valley Ware in Northern Britain. Um, of course, there were limitations on this study um, due to its nature as an undergraduate dissertation. Uh, there were time limits and, and word limits and so on. So that plays a part. Um, but also many of the reports, particularly those for rural sites and, and those unpublished reports, only quantified uh, the, the material using generic descriptors. So for example, many of the reports simply termed uh, much of the assemblage oxidized wares uh, and so where this has happened it's been excluded for accuracy because of course if that's the case um, it may well be possible that there are oxygen wear uh, or new wild value wear shirts there but they aren't explicitly identified and so it would be compromised in the data set um, to include them ultimately aside from that in terms of the sites that were recorded it was recorded where Oxfordshire ware was present, only in Valley ware was present, or in 15 cases where both were present, and but also the sites uh, that were sufficiently re reported on sufficient detail were, were, were recorded where both wares were absent. And these sites were broken down into categories of rural, urban military, Scottish and stray finds, and where available uh, for the shirts, vessel class and type information was also recorded. So again, really briefly, because I'm sure many of you are already aware of this, um, the Oxford, Oxfordshire industry consisted of more than 30 kilns. It was producing from 1st through 4th centuries AD. And really, Oxfordshire red brand slipware came into production from about AD 240 and lasted until the end of the 4th century. The most common product of Oxfordshire colour coated ware and, and probably the Oxfordshire industry more broadly are, are bulls. Um, and these kilns were split into three groups, and it's the group three kilns and the kiln site at Lower Farm that's producing uh, Oxfordshire ware. And again, for the Neen Valley, uh, it's producing from the first through fourth centuries. The industry as a whole peaked slightly earlier than that of Oxford, um, Oxfordshire, and that it peaked in the second century. And that's when we begin to see the emergence of Neen Valley colour coated ware production. But it isn't really until the third century, and perhaps later in, in, in few cases, um, that the kilns really start to, to, to kick in and produce these Neen Valley ware colour coated ware products in significant quantities. And from the Neen Valley ware, it's normally um, the beakers that appear to be the most common product. So moving on to the actual data collected, um, as a brief overview, there was 110 sites included from across Britain, north of the Humber, of which 63 produced examples of either Oxfordshire ware or Neen Valley ware. 15 sites yielded examples of both wares, uh, and the remaining 32 sites had no, non, uh, no examples of either Oxfordshire uh, or Neen Valley ware present. And from the whole 110 sites, there were only 75 shirts in total of Oxfordshire ware recorded. 
So you can straight, see straight away, we're dealing with some very small quantities, um, particularly for Oxfordshire wear. And then again, for Neen Valley wear, in the grand scheme of things, quite small, though obviously considerably larger assemblage than for Oxfordshire wear, there's 4,320 shirts recorded. Now these are primarily from urban military sites. 97.59% of these shirts come from urban military contexts. Um, and that comes from 22 and 71 sites respectively. So if you look at that in real numbers, um, you can see there 78 sites were either where or both were present. Of those sites, uh, 78 sites, 44 were urban military. And you can see where the sites were, where uh, no evidence of either where was found or primarily uh, rural sites with 20 of the 32 sites uh, being defined as rural and only 12 urban military. As I said before, there were 15 sites in the study that produced examples of both wares. Uh, as you'd expect, these were both military, urban military sites, uh, 11 out of the 15 in total, with only two coming from uh, two sites being rural and, and one Scottish and one stray find. So to move on specifically now to the data itself and in terms of classes represented, uh, for Oxfordshire where only 71 of the 75 shirts had vessel class information available in the site report. But you can still see this very strong trend towards bulls, 90%, just over 90% uh, of the 71 shirts off, off on bulls. And the next most abundant being uh, motorium and 5.6%, so quite a significant gap there. And it's only bulls and motorium uh, that are represented by more than one shirt. All the other forms and classes represented, so in this case, beakers, flagons, miniature vessels, and so on, um, they're only represented by one shirt in total across the whole of Northern Britain. Um, that, that are included in this study, and they account for 1.4% each um, of the overall 71 shirts. Now, if you look in a bit more depth for those that uh, have the detail provided, 54 of those 71 shirts are also identifiable to type level. And as you can see from the chart there, there's a fairly decent selection, but it does represent a very severely restricted range of forms compared with uh, the 1977 type series by Young. And you can see most of these are uh, bull forms, from the 40s up to the 90s are bull forms. Um, by far and away, the most common is the C51 flanged bull, which copies uh, the DR38 Samian form. Um, and as I said before, aside from bulls and motorium, every other vessel class represented is only represented by one shirt. So for the miniature vessels, which is of note, is a fairly uncommon form, that's the C109. Uh, and also noteworthy are the C85 and C87, both of which are bulls, um, but they're relatively unusual types. So these are handled bulls. Um, and they're not particularly common. Uh, so something to, to note for later on. Uh, in terms of Neen Valley wear, again, the vast majority of shirts were not uh, identified to class level. So out of 4,320, only 246 were identified uh, to class. Uh, again, within that, there is a strong trend towards beakers, 69.5%. Um, so it's, as the most common product of the industry overall, it's probably safe to say that that is a genuine trend. Uh, the next most abundant being 8.9%, uh, which is bulls. So still quite a significant gap between the, the, the main uh, class available in the north uh, and then the next most abundant. Uh, interestingly, there are examples of the caster box, five shirts in total accounting for 2% um, of the 246 shirts overall, which is of note again, as with the uncommon Oxfordshire forms, which will be discussed later. Um, only 87 of the 246 shirts had type information assigned to them. And within those 87 sh shirts, there was no strong trend towards a particular type. Um, though it is of note, again, that there were three examples uh, of shirts from Hunt Cups and, and, as I said, five from Caster Boxes. And so if we move on specifically to the distributions now, um, you can see on the map there, that's the, uh, the Oxfordshire distribution. You can see very clearly uh, it's an almost exclusively Eastern distribution pattern. And within that, the, it's very rare to find uh, Oxfordshire wear outside of an urban military context. So if you look to Scotland, first of all, you can see two anomalous sites. So on the East Coast, that's Trapper and Law, um, of course, exceptional in many respects, um, but it is far outside the northern distribution area, uh, and yet it produces the second largest assemblage of Oxfordshire wear uh, in this study. It's a total of 11 shirts. And if you look over to the west coast of Scotland, uh, even more intriguingly, uh, is the site of Keel Caves in, in Argyll, and that produces only one shirt of Oxfordshire wear, and it's the only truly Western example uh, found in this study. And so that begs the question, how did that get there? Uh, possibly, if not probably, um, it was a transshipment from Trapper in Law, since there's no other reasonable explanation 
um, as to why only one shed would end up um, so far outside uh, of a relatively exclusive distribution pattern. So if we sort of set aside those two Scottish sites for the time being as outliers, and we look at the core distribution area in the north, the vast majority of sheds come from York and its hinterlands. 33 of the total 75 sheds um, come from sites in and around York. And, and of, the, of any individual site, uh, it's Wellington Row in York that produces the largest assemblage of Oxfordshire Ware sheds um, at about 19 sheds. And again, there's the distribution map uh, for Neen Valley Ware. As you can see, it is more widely, uh, widely distributed than Oxfordshire Ware. Significantly greater quantities are recovered from sites. Um, but again, it is predominantly distributed throughout the east of Britain. The largest quantities are found in the east. It is distributed to the west, albeit more thinly. Uh, and as you can see from the map, hopefully, um, it does appear to have quite a strong adherence to the rural network, particularly as it moves westwards. Again, you can see up in Scotland, there's the site of Trapperin Law. Uh, again, far outside the distribution area for the north. Uh, but it still produces 15 sherds. Now, unlike with Oxfordshire Ware, um, we're dealing with quite significant numbers in York. So 15 sheds isn't a particularly large assemblage in, in, in context, but it is interesting to see 15 sheds so far outside of the, of the core distribution area. And so if we exclude that again as an anomaly for the time being, and we look at where the bulk of the sheds come from, again, it's York and its hinterlands producing 3,581 for the total of 4,320 sheds. Again, it's the site at Wellington Row in York that produces the largest assemblage of any individual site. 1,728 sheds come from Wellington Row alone. It's not the only site to produce a substantial assemblage. Um, fairly substantial assemblages also came from Catterick and from Piercebridge, but they don't produce anywhere near 1,728 sheds. Uh, as is to be expected for both Oxfordshire and Mean Valley Ware, um, it's really the rural sites that are producing consistently the lowest uh, quantities uh, of, of, of these wares. Uh, for Oxfordshire Ware, um, the, the highest assemblage to come from a rural site was uh, four sheds from uh, the villa site at Ingleby Barwick. Uh, and for Neen Valley Ware, it is um, nine sheds from the roadside settlement at Shiftonthorpe. And, and so really having set out that distribution, um, or those distributions rather, uh, and also that the numbers we're dealing with, very small quantities uh, when considered co in comparison with many of the other late Roman uh, pottery industries. It's clear that this isn't forming part of, of primary trade or continuous trade. It's not a primary trading product. These are not primary tra trading products, sorry. Um, but it is possible, um, particularly in the case of Oxfordshire Ware, um, that they are arriving as a secondary product or perhaps as curiosities and being transported north via sea uh, up the East Coast. There's a couple of indications for this. So in many of the sites that Oxfordshire Ware in the north has been recorded, it's often found in association with Southern Shell Tempered Wares, which we do know um, arrive mainly via up the East Coast uh, via sea. And that pattern is replicated um, at several logical stopping off points. So for example, sites of Brancaster and Caestor and Sea further south along the East Coast. Um, they also produce significant quantities of Oxfordshire ware. And again, it's associated with deposits of, of Southern Shell Tempered Wares. Um, so that potentially suggests a, a method by which that these, uh, these sherds are arriving in the North. And if you look at the kiln sites themselves in Oxfordshire, they are fairly well located um, to allow shipment eastwards down the River Thames to London and then out into the sea and up the East Coast. And if that is the case, it goes a long way to explaining why we see such a heavily restricted distribution pattern uh, in the Oxfordshire wares um, almost exclusively appearing in the East. Now, for Neen Valley ware, again, despite there being quite a substantial amount more than for Oxfordshire ware, overall, it's not really that many um, um, sherds of Neen Valley Ware in the entirety of Northern Britain. And so there's little indication, again, that this is forming a, a part of primary trade or, or, or as a major trading product. Having said that, there is no evidence, as there is for Oxfordshire Ware, that this is arriving via sea. Instead, as I mentioned before, and when referencing to the map, it appears to have quite a strong adherence to the rural network, um, as I said, particularly as it moves westwards. And so this could potentially account for the significant quantities found at York, so in this instance, what would be happening is, is the production would be taking place in the Neen Valley and then using the main arterial routes northwards um, via Airman Street to York, the majority of which is staying in York, being used in York and traded in York. Um, some of it is being taken farther north by, uh, via Deer Street um, and also some of it is moving westwards, again, 
as you can see fairly clearly from the map, if, if you if you think back um, via the road network. It's also possible that the reduced numbers um, in the western part of Northern Britain is not only due to the lack of a main sort of east-west route for traders, um, but also because it's increasingly difficult in terms of terrain moving westwards, traveling across the Pennines, particularly if we're talking about transporting um, ceramics. And so that might explain the smaller quantities from western sites. And so another thing that was considered at the beginning of the study um, was the potential influence of markets and fairs. Um, now, pure markets and fairs, it's possible, but unlikely, um, that many of these wares, uh, many of these shirts were arriving uh, via markets or, or, or fairs. Um, of course, much of the, the assemblages have been found on urban military sites, and urban military sites do act as redistributive centres uh, in the Roman period. Um, but the low, low quantities overall particularly of Oxfordshire ware, but also of mean value ware, suggests that that probably wasn't um, a significant influence on their arrival and distribution in the north. It is possible that some of these wares, particularly for mean value, were arriving as secondary products, traveling northwards as curiosities or, or simply to, to fill space alongside primary trading goods um, and being so, sold off at these markets and fairs. Um, but it's not having a significant impact, I would say, um, on the overall quantities and distribution. Something else to consider is something of a trade in reverse. So what we might be seeing here um, in certain cases is northern traders and merchants traveling south to supply the southern regions. Uh, and on the return trip, they take a small selection of the local goods back with them. Uh, and that's how we see some of these wares arriving in the north, particularly um, perhaps in the case of, of, the, of the less common forms. Um, so the handled bows and miniature vessels for Oxfordshire ware uh, and the caster boxes and so on for, for Neen Valley ware. Now, the final thing that was set out at the beginning uh, as a potential um, explanation for these wares arrival uh, was interprovincial migration or mobility. Now, this is clearly far less easily addressed. Um, and it's far less easily proven, and it's certainly not going to be the main driver overall um, of these wares arrival in Northern Britain. Having said that, it's inconceivable that there would have been no interprovincial migration at all. Um, in the late Roman period, particularly when we consider the presence of major urban centres such as York. So it's possible that these wares, uh, or at least some of these examples, of travelling north as personal effects or as mementos or, or whatever it may be, um, serving to help in the production and the maintenance of regional identities. And it's long been accepted, I think, um, that material culture does have a part of playing these processes in, in Roman Britain. And it's been you know, talked about and discussed for various other uh, categories of material culture. So several brooch types have had this sort of discussion surrounding them, uh, as well as more unique um, uh, categories of evidence, such as the perforated bone spoons from Yorkshire and so on. The presence of several uncommon Oxfordshire ware forms, um, but also the presence of things like the caster box, which has largely been associated with food ways in, in a particular style of, of, of cooking and eating. Um, these are potentially indicators, more indicative um, than standard uh, body shirts and, and, and standard forms um, of interprovincial migration and potentially the indicative of migrants coming from the north, coming from the south rather, um, and bringing these personal effects with them in order to continue to express or maintain identity, or perhaps in the case of the caster box particularly, um, to continue a particular way of eating and drinking. And so by way of conclusion, I think the best thing to do really um, would be to circle back around to the main aims of the project. Um, so the first aim was, of course, to set out where possible um, distributions, uh, quantified distributions for both wares. And I think broadly that aim has been achieved. Um, while we are dealing with relatively small quantities, and of course there's opportunity to expand um, the study in, in terms of depth and scope, the patterns that have emerged in distribution have been relatively strong, particularly for Oxfordshire ware, where it's a pretty much exclusively Eastern distribution pattern, bar the one example, the Keel Caves in Argyle, and again, exclusively almost uh, military. And for Neen Valley, predominantly Eastern, thinner in the West, um, and again, predominantly urban military. And um, so I think that aim has largely been met. We've also managed to get a better understanding of, of how much, um, how many shirts we're talking about, 100 shirts, uh, less than 100 shirts of Oxfordshire ware, and less than 5,000 of Neen Valley. So of course, given more time, giving more detailed reporting and so on, it's possible, if not likely, that more shirts will be uncovered 
Um, but I don't think, given the strength of the trends observed, that further excavation and so on would massively upset um, the trends set out in this paper. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean it shouldn't, it shouldn't take place. Um, it, perfectly possible that you might see a change in picture, um, particularly in terms of vessel classes and forms represented. But I think broadly speaking, in terms of the quantities, we're not talking about much. Uh, and bulls, certainly for Oxfordshire Ware and, and Beakers for Neen Valley Ware, do appear to be the dominant forms, uh, uh, which matches the rest of the, the, the distribution pattern across the country or the province. And in terms of uh, how these wares are arriving, I think the safest um, conclusion to make is that these are not arriving via primary trade. Uh, they're not primary products, but they are arriving via trade in some fashion, minor trade, secondary trade, and so on. Um, Oxfordshire Ware appears to be arriving via the East Coast, as I said, uh, and Neen Valley Ware appears to have a particularly strong association with the road network. And it's very unlikely that markets and fairs, interprovincial migration would have any significant impact um, on the quantities and distributions in the North. Having said that, the presence of some of the unusual forms may indicate in certain circumstances um, that some of these wares are being brought northwards um, by, as personal effects, by uh, intra-provincial migrants. And so finally, to, to conclude uh, and round off, um, I do just want to say again, thank you to Dr. James Gerard uh, at Newcastle um, for the support and the advice he offered during this dissertation project. And also to Professor Ian Haynes at Newcastle uh, for access to some of his unpublished site data um, and to Dr Karen Newman for help and assistance in uh, training me up in GIS and without whom none of this would have been possible. Uh, so and of course thank you all again for your interest and, and hopefully I'll be able to answer any questions that you might have.